All right, uh, I want you to stand to your feet because I'm about to introduce to the platform, uh, like I said, one of God's generals, definitely an apostolic voice to this house and a father of this house as well as, as just being a, a father to Connie and I. God has not only blessed, let me tell you something, God has not only blessed John Avanzini with some tremendous revelation. He and I were sitting at my home on Saturday and he was just sharing with me out of Matthew 24 how to get prepared, how to prepare for the second coming. That was, I've never heard anything like that. It's all right there in the Bible, and you're going, how does everybody miss all this stuff? It's just really, really amazing. But uh, Brother John's going to bring the word this morning, and not only, uh, not only is he a great father in the faith, but Brother John has a real heart for people, a real love, love for people. You know, I'm going to tell something about Brother John. I just feel led to tell this. John would never tell this on, on himself. In fact, he may be mad at me when, when I tell this. You might get mad at me. You might. We were, we were downtown and we were coming out of a restaurant. And there was a lady that was walking past the restaurant and she was obviously homeless. She had a, uh, she had a shopping cart. I don't, I don't know that she was homeless, but she had a shopping cart. She was really, really frump, frumpy, and she had an old hat on, and she was pushing a shopping cart, and it looked like in that shopping cart was everything that she owned. I don't know that, but it just looked that way. Do y'all do get in the picture of, and she was, she was just tottering along with this cart, and Brother John, she, she didn't walk within five feet of us, but she was across the parking lot, and Brother John saw her, and he said, <laughs> he said, honey, come here a minute. Come here a minute, honey, come here a minute. And she saw him and she took off. Of course, she didn't go very fast, but she took off. She's going like this, you know. She's looking at him. Here comes this man she doesn't know after her and uh, walked up to her and gave her $100. And uh, he would never tell you he did that. And I probably shouldn't have told you. But then, uh, <clears throat> then um, we got in the car. We were getting ready to go somewhere and this was a couple years ago. Either he or Connie needed something. I don't remember what it was. And so two doors down, there was a Kroger. And uh, I went in that Kroger to pick up something for Connie. And uh, while I was in there, there she was going up the aisles, and she was just loading that buggy down with food. And, uh, you know, so, you know, just being sensitive to God. And I'll, I'll tell you something. John Avanzini, uh, I'm not, I'm not going to tell you behind the scenes what I know about him. John Avanzini is one of the most generous people that I know. One of the most generous people that I know. Uh, and he's really blessed us the last two messages, huh? I mean, last night was one of the most powerful messages I ever heard on the second voice. I'll never listen to the second voice again. I know that voice, don't you? You know that second voice? <laughs> I know that second voice very well. The most profound thing he said last night, I want you to listen to this, is if you listen to it often enough, the second voice will become the first voice. And you'll miss the will of God every single time. When you said that, I just, I wanted to cry when you said that. If you listen to the second voice often enough, it will become the first voice in your life. And then I added, then I added, and then you'll miss the will of God every time. That was, that was worth the price of admission, Brother John. Hey, would you welcome to the platform, Dr. John Avanzini. Brother John. Amen. Are we going to walk off the floor or up here? Oh, praise God. Wow. Thank you, sir. Thank you. My goodness. Hold on a minute before you sit down. A little too much volume, I think. Before you sit down, tell that person near to you that Brother John thinks they look real nice. Okay, would you do that for me? Nice. All right. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I am, uh, I, I sat last night trying to really pull together what God would have me bring. And I, I, I came up with what I felt it was. And then pastor got up there and commented on it. The, uh, the, what Jesus taught about being ready for the second coming. How many of you know he knew something about that? Oh, you must teach that. That's what I'm teaching. Awesome. Right. Amen. What Jesus taught about how to be ready for the second coming. Now, I guess if there's anybody who knows how to be ready for the second coming, it'd be Jesus. Yep. But amazing, it's never taught. It's taught out of context when it is taught. But look with me with the uh, 24th chapter of the book of Matthew. And uh, we're just going to go verse by verse on this see, for a little while, a little different kind. I won't be preaching, I'll just be teaching. Uh, the 24th chapter, the 
first verse says, and Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, see ye not all these things verily. And by the way, do you know what, you know what verily, what you know, those are the things that you're probably not going to believe. Verily, this is going to happen. Verily, verily, I say unto you. You know, I mean, anytime you see that, it just means I'm about to tell you something that you're probably not going to believe. Get ready for it. But here he says, verily, I say unto thee, uh, I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives and the disciples came. Now, did you notice something? There's two scenes. The scenery just changed. Bing, bing. And it can happen to us real careful, not careful. It can really happen. Because what did you see? He came out of the temple. He spoke about the temple. And then on the Mount of Olives. On the Mount of Olives. So if you watch for a little subtle things, it'll help you. Uh, and then you get for, uh, you get down into that third verse. And he sat upon the Mount of Olives. And his disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things, uh, when shall the, the signs, uh, tell me, what shall be the signs of thy coming? And to the end of the world. Woo. Boy, that's a hot question, isn't it? There's a great interest in the future. There's probably more books written on this two chapters that we're going to look at. And probably 24, probably more books written on 24 than, than any other chapter in the Bible that people have written on. Because everywhere you look, everybody's got the answer to the second coming. It's this one. It's Mussolini. It's, it's uh, Hitler when I was young. And then it's going to be Kissinger. And it just won't down the road who the Antichrist is. And people just can't get enough of that. They, they, I mean, you, a prophecy conference, so you load up the place with a prophecy conference. But, you know, it's amazing, but all the things that are preached about, there's absolutely nothing you can do about them. Can't change it. But there is given some things that you can do to be ready for it. But let's look at the things that are common in this, when they, this is discussed. They're asking, what's going to be the end of the earth? What's, when's it going to come to an end? Then the fifth verse, he said, many shall come in my name saying, I'm Christ. And Brother John, I don't see a bunch of people walking around saying they're Jesus. No, what they said was, I'm Christ. I am anointed. Yep. Everywhere you go, there's not a person that's got a Bible or a building or a storefront they're in. They're anointed. See, I don't hear a lot of people saying I'm Jesus. But I, every day, everywhere, I meet people that say they're anointed. Yep. And hey, they can't all be anointed and be teaching such different things. So you got to watch for that. But he says, many are going to come saying uh, they're anointed. And we're in that day today. I don't know whether there's ever been so many people that going around saying they're anointed. And then you go on down. And he says, uh, uh, Christ and will shall deceive many. Man, that's, that, that marks the day. And you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. Man, I tell you, wars and rumors of wars. We'll go back over history and find a time that there wasn't a war, a rumor of a war. There's never been peace. Never has this planet seen any peace. If you take it all in its totality. And then it goes on and says, um, well, let me find a place I'm at. He said, uh, the world and answered, uh, take heed unto you, they'll deceive you. Many will come saying, I'm the Christ. Sixth verse. There were wars and rumors of wars. And then he says in that end of that sixth verse, but the end is not yet. And then he goes on, nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There'll be pestilences, famine. Uh, this is the beginning of sorrows. Uh, then you go on to the, uh, let's look at the uh, ninth verse. And, and because iniquity shall abound and the love of many shall wax cold. Oh yeah, that, you know what I mean? We can just, can you just, how many books have you read that go right down this list here? And it's good to do it if that's what they want to do. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Now watch this. Many people believe and very good people, very sincere people, believe that when the name of Jesus is heard all over the earth, when everybody's heard, the Lord's coming back. So he did not doing that. He didn't say when the gospel of the king is preached. He said when the gospel of the kingdom. You can't have kingdom teaching without a local church. Thank you. you can't have kingdom teaching without a local church. Because getting saved is the gospel of Jesus. But if you're going to deal with kingdom truth, it comes line upon line, precept upon precept. It, you really have to put your head with it to, to get in the place God wants you in relation to a church. Good. 
So be careful with this thing because you, people just walk through this stuff. Well, the kingdom of God, this, that, and the other. And they'll tell you, well, you know, the Israel is this, that. No, it was the Jews that was that way. Israel is a whole different uh, uh, situation than, than the Jews. So be real careful that you look at what you're told. And especially when it comes from outside, you know, it can be kind of like when I'm out a while. I, Mama used to say, come wash your hands. So uh, people are going to, uh, 10th verse, people are going to betray each other. You get down there to 12th verse, iniquity shall abound. The love of many will wax cold. 14th verse, this gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached everywhere. We're not the gospel about the king. It's being preached everywhere. But now we've got to catch up with the evangelists and build churches. So you go on from that and it says, uh, let's see, I'm at the 15th verse. When, uh, when ye therefore uh, shall see the... Uh, uh, when ye therefore shall see, am I saying that right? When uh, the abomination of desolation. Oh, that man has two chapters on just the abomination of desolation. And the 21st verse, for then shall a, shall a great tribulation. Oh, my golly. This is it. Great tribulation. And there's several books, hundreds of books written on that. And you just go through. It's about the word. It's about, uh, uh, it goes there for uh, well, just look at it when you get a chance. There's so many. Every one of them is a hot button scripture. And if you get on over there, uh, uh, you get in that 36th verse for the day and the hour knoweth no man. Uh, uh, you know, and he goes on. Uh, 20, thir uh, 30, did I say 36? 37th uh, verse. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. Church, this is not stuff that's just, this has been going on forever. I mean, the thing about it was years ago, whenever man controlled everything in the world and any place that they do now, there's no fidelity. All these things that you're reading right there are taking place. You take some of these uh, uh, religions in the world. I mean, women are, I mean, a man's got more respect for his cow than he does his wife. Yeah. There's some better ones out there outside of uh, Israel, out of sight of uh, Jerusalem that if they, their, their law says if they want to divorce a woman, they just put her out in front of the tent put her stuff out there and just loudly disclaim her and she's on her own. So, but now we're coming to see that uh, it just shocks us. Oh, the divorce rates going up in America and it's bad, but that doesn't just mean that you come down to the end of time yeah. because that's just been going on. There hadn't been a time that that wasn't going on. It goes on, but then you get down here now and, uh, but know this 43rd verse, but know this, uh, if the good man, the, uh, if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have uh, uh, suffered uh, his house to be broken up. Now, what is it saying there? If the guy just knew, if he just understood when it was going to happen, he could be there to stop it. And that's the same thing with the second coming of Christ. How are you going to deal with it if you don't know exactly when it is? You've got to be ready. You've got to be ready, whether it be morning, whether it be evening. Just got to be ready for the return of the Lord. And uh, so then now Jesus, first thing he does is he tells us how to be ready for the second coming. All right. Now, this is going to be amazed some of you, but um, you'll see it. I'm not making it up. It's in the book. Now, it begins there on the 44th verse. Therefore, be also ready. What do you do? All this way, he talked about stuff you can't do anything about. Can't stop wars, rumors of wars, can't, I mean, uh, uh, abomination, whatever it is, have desolation. How are you going to stop that? I mean, you just go bang, 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 bang. What you, how are you going to do about that? It's interesting to listen to, but I need something to, that, that'll move me to the next level. Not just, uh, you, you follow what I mean? I need to have headlines. And here it is. Lord says, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. The other thing's going to happen. Well, what can I do about it, Lord? Can't do a thing. But right here, he says, 44th verse, therefore, because of all this mess up here, be ye also ready, for in such a tower as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Now watch this, 41st verse, he's going to deal with the first requirement or to be ready for the second coming. He says, who then is a faithful and a wise a servant who his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Remember that, to give them meat in due season. It says, blessed is that servant when his Lord, uh, and when his Lord, excuse me, uh, let me go back. Blessed is that servant who his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. 
the second coming, you see. It's talking about when the Lord returns. And what's going to happen? There's some guy, this guy here is behaving himself. He's doing right. He's feeding. He's doing, he's seeing these things that have to do. But let me tell you, everything he has to do here has to do with money. How you spend your money. If there's going to be meat, it costs money to have meat. Well, Brother John, you know, spiritually, that, spiritually that means, well, the church, the preaching. Mercy, do you have, understand how much it costs to run a church? Well, Brother John, if we had more people, would it? Oh, the more people you have, the more expensive it gets. Because every time you grow, then you got to build a building. You don't just build a building for the people you have. You build it two or three times bigger for the people that never even showed up there yet. Yep. So don't ever think that, re, you know, bigger church is cheaper. It's, it's a whole lot cheaper to be in a storefront. But you don't get a whole lot done financially. But here he says, there's some people that I'm leaving and they're going to, he uses a parable. He says, they're going to be feeding and not fooling around. Listen to this other thing over here. It goes on. He says, uh, when you get to that 46 word, blessed is a servant when his Lord uh, uh, com- when he cometh and shall find him so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over his goods. But if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming. Now listen to this. My Lord delays his coming. What does it say? Many, many will say, Lord, Lord. Many will say, Lord, Lord. But here it is right here. This guy, is, he's in a leadership position. He's got responsibility. He's got to be feeding. But instead, he turns around and he begins in his heart, it rises up. Just the same thing. We heard it last night. Satan, uh, 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 Ananias, why'd you let Satan fill your heart? Man, you got to guard your heart. You know what that Bible says about guard your heart? When it says guard your heart for out of it are the issues of life. Well, you know, it's, it's, no, no, no. It's the boundaries as the land issued forth to here, and as the land issued forth to there, it's, a, it's a, a surveying term. And if you don't guard your heart, you'll close the parameters of your life. But if you keep your heart right with God, I mean your horizons keep getting bigger and bigger. You, say, you, you follow what I'm saying? Yes. You have to be real careful because it sounds like, oh, you got to take care of your heart because, uh, you know, you're not going to. No, it has to do with how big your vision can be if you keep your heart guarded. Because everything in the kingdom of darkness wants to stop, wants to stop you from rising up and being all that God said you could be. Yep. Well, now let's see. We go a little bit further. Sir. Uh, uh, here comes the 48th verse. Uh, but if that evil uh, servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with the drunken. Uh, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and in an hour that he is not aware and shall cut him asunder and uh, uh, asunder uh, and, uh, and appoint him his portion uh, with the hypocrites that shall be, we- there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Has to do with meat. How many of you know it costs money for meat? Meat for the table costs money. And if you say, no, well, that's talking about spiritual meat. That costs more money. Yeah. Yeah. You follow? So here Jesus says, you got to do this. And if you don't do it, this happens to you. If you do it, this good thing will happen to you. And it has to do with how you spend your money. Now, here we are talking about the second coming. One of the biggest events, probably the biggest event outside of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and the raising from the dead. But... Uh, Okay, Lord, okay, we've got to have our money straight. All right, we, now we got it. We're going on from here. Get some real meat in this, Lord, and get us ready for the second coming. Well, okay, let's go a little further and see what he says. 25th chapter. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no all with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. And all these virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. That trim just got it ready uh, to to function. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us your oil, uh, for our lamps have gone out. 
But the wise answered and saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us. And but go ye rather to them that sell and to buy for yourselves. And while they were gone, now let's stop there a minute. The general teaching from one end of the planet to the other. I mean, you go right through the denomination. This is the general teaching. The oil is the Holy Ghost. How many of you ever heard that? But isn't it going to be amazing if that's not what it is? But wouldn't it be worth knowing? So let's see what it really is. So what they're told here said there's some folks that showed up here with uh, their lamps. Now what's the purpose of lamps? Light. So they, they're there with lamps. They're slumbering. They wake up. They don't have. They don't have, the, they don't have oil. And they go to those that have oil. And they said, we can't give you any of ours. Because if we do, there won't be enough for us. Are you seeing that? Are you catching what I'm saying to you? Or do we need to go back and read it again? I'll read it again to you. Let's read it. He says, uh, all those virgins trim their lamps, seven, the foolish uh, and the wise give, give, give us into your oil. That verse says, give us your oil for our lamps are gone out. But the wise saying, not so, lest there not be enough for us. If this is the Holy Ghost, how do you explain giving it away makes less of it? If this, is the, if this is the Holy Ghost, then this means the more of it you give away, the more of it there is. Because one day the first man that came to this city filled with the Holy Ghost, there was just one person here filled with the Holy Ghost. Well, when he had someone filled with the Holy Ghost, that mean there was half as much Holy Ghost in each one of them? There was more Holy Ghost in this town. And Holy Ghost just multiplies, multiplies, multiplies. So, I mean, you're not, you're not going to run short if you're out around teaching the, uh, 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 the filling of the Holy Ghost. And people get, you're not going to send up short yourself. There's more and more going to be to what you have. Yeah. Because the Holy Ghost is without limits. It's, it, there's capacity enough in that dimension of our Lord to see the whole world filled. That's right. So, it can, this is one of the points. It can't be the Holy Ghost. But then let's go a little bit further. That would be weak just by itself. But let's go just a little bit further. Uh, they come in there, but the answer saying, not so, we're not going to do it. And now watch. Go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Listen, let's look at a verse a minute. Look at Acts 8, Acts 8 and 20. And I'm sure this is what it is. I just jotted it down this morning. We'll just act like it is. I'll just read what's there if it's done. Acts 8 and, uh, let's see, 8 and uh, 20. 19, 20. And Peter said unto him, watch this, 17th verse. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that laying on the hands, the apostles' uh, hands, the Holy Ghost was given uh, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power with a, uh, of whomsoever I lay hands, they may, they may receive the Holy Ghost. And Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that you can buy the gift of the Holy Ghost. Are you catching what you just read? Yeah. He said, Simon Peter said, Curse you and your money. You can't buy the Holy Ghost. Not for sale. Not for sale. Bang. He was blind. Blind for a month. Are you getting what I just read to you? Yes. Number one, if it was the Holy Ghost, it would multiply as it's given away. Right. Or he would multiply as it's given away. But if it, and then if you can buy it with money, then you have to take uh, the eighth chapter probably and modify it over there of Acts. Because over there they said that curse it, curse it, if you think you can get it by buying and then they, they went to buy it. It wasn't just an off-the-cuff thing, but there was a procedure. You, uh, you, you, you got money, go buy it. And so he went to buy it. Okay? Now, what is, the, what are, is Jesus teaching? He's talking about the second coming here. Are you recognizing that? Yeah. We stayed in context, hadn't we? Yes. Coming right down, line upon line upon precept upon precept. In a minute, we're going to see where it began, and we're going to see where this piece of thought changes. When this scene changes, it changes just like that. And it goes to something else. But right now we're into the second thing that Jesus said, be also ready. Be also ready for what? Ready for the second coming. 
That's what all those verses before were going about. And this is, and he says, this man, if he's seen, when he comes again, when he's coming, all this is about he's come. And then this one's ready and this one not, this one's ready and this one's not. But the first thing is you've got to be putting your finances into the kingdom of God. So there's meat that the good servant can put out. Good. Let me tell you, there's nothing harder than to have a heart for something and a people that lag in their feet. Just quickly tell you a story. Down in Midland, Mid Midland, Texas, Texas, there was a church there, a very an active church, and they were in a, they were in a facility maybe fat, sat three, four hundred, and this thing they were wall to wall, two services, and so the pastor decided to build a building, and he said, "We're going to build this cash." Wow. So they started and they got it all the way up. It looked just like a church, but it didn't have the brick on the outside, nothing inside. It just, it just had the black, uh, you know, the, uh, whatever they call it, the tar paper all down the side of it. And it's sitting next to this little church. And here's this great big church they're building, but all of a sudden there's no more money to build it. And I go to the church a couple of times and I mean, one year to the next, that big old building sitting next to there empty. He was submitted to Charles Neiman was his father in the Lord. So I was sitting one day and I, I'd come back from there and I thought, man, this guy is something going wrong. And I knew he was a clean little guy and his church was good people. So I, call, I, I wrote a letter to him and I sent it to Charles, Charles Neiman and I put at the bottom Charles's name so that if he liked the letter, he could sign it and send it on. The man wasn't any of my business. I don't want anybody coming in and whipping my kids. I'll do the whipping for my kids. I mean, you know, I mean, there's a father of a, of, of a man. You don't go, if you know that he's in that kind of an operation, you don't just go run around and then run around the father. And hey, here's what God said to do. So anyway, Charles read it and it's good. Here's what I wrote him. I said, you have the faith to build that building cash. But you are in a corporate faith. You have attached yourself to several hundred people and you are not, in, you're not in your own anointing anymore. You're in a corporate anointing. And whoever's dragging their feet is slowing the thing down. And I said, preacher, you got, I know, I told him in that letter, you have the faith to build it. You and your wife are faith people. You talk it, you walk it, it happens. And I mean, but here's this building and he had the faith to do it. But when you attach yourself to a people like your pastors have, I mean, we're not going any faster than you want to go. We're not going to have more faith than you want to have. We're not going to see abundance in, uh, any beyond what you want to see it. Because this, this, this pastor, and I've been in that position many times, he's tied to you. And his faith is taught to you. And he can't drag you along. We've got to march along and have the same thing in mind. We've got to be the same mind. And I told him, I said, go down to the bank and borrow the money to finish it and then go on a short term. Just work real hard to get that loan paid off. Man, the building was finished. Pretty soon it was paid off. I came another time or so. Man, beautiful building starting to fill up again. But that thing was sitting out there as a, as a I mean, as a boil sitting on his forehead. I mean, every time you'd come by, you'd, 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 you'd want to go like this when you went in there. There it is, that great big monument to failure. You follow, but be real careful. Because, yes, you're a man of God's got faith. Why didn't he do this? Why didn't he do that? Well, his faith is encumbered with the hookup that he has with you. Wow. But it's not, it's not, God told him to do it. It's not that he wanted to hook up with a, something to slow him down. My wife and I, you've been in, did you, you've been in our building we had in, in Fort Worth. 138,000 square feet. Gargantuan building. And, uh. We'd built buildings several times and fight and try to get the finances and, oh, how are we going to finish it? All, I mean, just a war to get done. But this time, I was not pastoring a church. Pat and I had our faith tied in together. And in just two years, we came up with $6 million above what our budget was and paid cash for that building. Well, what was the difference? Brother John, you built in Denver. I mean, finally, you had to leave there because the, the, the church was in such financial trouble. Well, you built, in San Diego, you built over in San Diego, and it was a nightmare. Uh, uh, debt, debt, debt. But when you go to, to Fort Worth, and we build a building you could put the other buildings in, cash. Well, Pat and I are people of faith. We weren't dragging somebody along with us. 
she was walking in cadence with me and I was walking in cadence with her. So you need to understand that when, you, when you're part of this. You don't just like, I mean, if my kidneys don't want to function, right? It doesn't matter how much my brain is about doing something. My kidneys will shut the whole thing down. Do you follow? Or your arm gets cut off. Now, there's things you can do and it's one, but you never are as, as nimble as you were when you had two arms. It's something about the whole body has got to be running in a symphony. That's good, John. In a symphony. Yeah, yeah. Whew. That's just, and, and I, I left the thought here just a minute, but are you seeing the, the Holy Ghost? What is it? Well, it's not the Holy Ghost. It's how you spend your money. Because what happened here? What is the problem whenever they come up to go in? Those that got to go in, the five wise, they had oil for their lamp. And what does the, uh, it's a 12th chapter, yeah, it's a f fifth chapter, Matthew uh, 5, 16. Let me just, I'll tell you what it says. We don't, just stay with me here. It says, let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and they glorify God for it. What is the oil for? The oil is for making light. And God, these, talk, uh, you know what happened? They showed up there and they still had their money in their pocket. They had not bought the oil. They'd not provided for the light. And while they were off buying the oil, see, the situation here is not the Holy Ghost, not that. The situation here is that it was time for the Lord to return and they had their money in their pocket instead of having the portion that belonged in the house of God or in the things of God. No oil, no oil. See, and the other, let me say this, I've heard some great messages on it the other way, powerful messages. You, you, you follow, but this doesn't mean that it's so. And real men of God and women of God, if they hear what is so, they don't say, well, I got to stick with what we've been teaching. Well, I got a book written on that and I can't change now. I wrote it another way. <laughs> Are you getting it? Yeah. Second way, be ready for coming an hour that you think not. What do you do? Well, you have meat. You, you, you're buying meat. Oh, no, I'm using it on myself. I'm using it on myself instead of putting it in the kingdom. And here they show up. Now it's oil time. And there I don't have any oil. And they run up there. No, you can't have an ours. We'll run out. Mm -hmm. And then they said, go where they're selling it. And they run to buy it. They got money in their pocket to buy it. But they should have bought it before the king came. See, a lot of people think, boy, when Jesus comes, there's going to be a great revival. No, it's not going to be a revival at all. Not, won't nobody get saved on that day. You got to be saved before he returns. Because when he returns, it doesn't mean that the, now we're going to have a big time with Jesus. It means we're going on to another dimension. Yeah. And I mean, the train is already loaded. Everybody that's going is on board and it pulls out of the station. Whew. Are you getting that? Yes. Two things. Now that's all right. Okay, Lord. Two things. I got to be ready for the second coming. I got it, Lord. I got my money all straightened out. Let's go on and see what the next thing is, Lord. Well, let's move down a little bit further. And the 14th verse, I believe, is, uh, <laughs> for a kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. So get that in your mind. When you get saved and when you get right with God and start moving in the Holy Ghost, he's not trying to get money from you. He's trying to get money to you. Yep. This is the way it is in the kingdom of God. Yep. Now, there's other kingdoms that operate different, but the kingdom of God operates this way. God is not wanting to take your money. He's wanting to give you some money so that you can see the things that he wants done. Good. And then the 15th verse, under one he give five talents and talents. You'll read in a minute that this is not tap dancing and typing fast. It's, it's a measurement of money. All right. To one he gave five talents, another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several abilities. Abilities? Well, you know, uh, he's just got a good mind. He's just got a good mind. He, he'll do real. No. You've got to know what the task is to know who qualifies. I mean, the greatest scientist in the world probably could not work in a metal shop running a lathe. Right. Here's what you got. According to their abilities. Now, what is the ability that's required of a steward? The ability of a steward is to do exactly what the master said to do with his money. Exactly. For instance, you have several stewards. You come to the point where you have stewards and you give, them a, you give them a money. You send one of them out. I want you to go out there and I want you to buy that, uh, uh, buy that piece of land. We've been waiting to buy it. I have it now. Go pay for the land. That night he comes in. He's got a, 
a Caterpillar tractor. Say, what, what, what do you got here? What's, where's the land? He said, well, I thought we need this more than we did the land. Now, next morning when you're loading up your uh, stewards to go, how much is he going to get? Nothing. See, the, uh, according to their several abilities is you're not going to be a steward unless you have steward abilities. You can't pilot a plane unless you have airplane abilities. You follow? Yep. And I want to be a steward, number one. What is it, number one? What are you going to do? How are you going to handle my money? God says, are you going to be faithful in it? Or are you going to play games with it? Wow. Well, his money again, but maybe, the, the, maybe it'll turn a little bit here and get a little more spiritual. <laughs> it says, and one that received five, but uh, the 18th, he that had received, oh, go up to second, uh, uh, and likewise, uh, he received two, and it, uh, I'm down too far, is that correct? Midnight, 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 excuse me. Okay, yeah, yeah. Anyway, you, you know the story. There's, there's one given five, one's given two, one's given one. And he spoke down here, I think, into the, uh, oh, about the 18th verse. But he that had received one went and digged the earth and hid his Lord's money. Money. You follow? This verse is about money. Lord, I thought this is a very spiritual thing, the second coming. Well, three times about money. Now, Lord, there's only four times that he tells us what to do. Well, three are going with money, but the fourth one must really be a blowout kind of a spiritual thing. Well, let's look at it. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Now, watch that word reckoneth. Did you know reckoneth is a, is a uh, bookkeeping term? I mean, the, people say, well, how has God had to do with money? Well, he places so many things in money. And whenever he looks at this crowd, he says, uh, what, 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 you're going to give an accounting now. You follow? And the next thing he talks about down here, you're going to hear it. He said, well, you should put my money with the, with the lenders and just got some interest on it. And then he says, here, take this unprofitable servant, the one that doesn't make me anything, and put him out. Good Lord. I mean, what the Bible says is so different than what has been the general acceptance of things. Come on with me. Let's go a little further. I can find a place again. We'll go on. Uh, so the 20th verse says, so the he that had received five talents came, brought another five talents, another five measurements of money. He has 10 measures of money now. Thou deliverest unto him five talents. Behold, he has gained uh, besides them five talents more, 21st verse, his Lord said unto him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou, uh, uh, that was faithful over a little few things. I'm not going to make the ruler over many things. Enter thou now into the joy of the Lord. Wow. He says, you handled your money right? Come on. You're going you're gonna to control many cities. Many cities. And says, come on in right now. You've done right with your money. Come on in here. Wow. Wow. This is, this is scary. He is also that received two talents, came and said, uh, Lord, thou deliverest unto me uh, two talents. Behold, I have gained two others. Talents besides them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Let me ask you something here a minute. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. Does that mean you go in and get God's joy? Or does it mean you're going to come in and be a joy to him? Enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter in with those people that are making him happy. I don't know whether that's true or not, but it's real good. <laughs> so let's get back where I was now. Uh, then he comes. Oh, when we get down to where it's one, I think. Uh, oh, yeah, one here. Let me catch it. Forgive me for not having rather. Uh, yeah, the, then which had received, 24th verse, and that which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strawn, and I was afraid, and I went and hid the, thy talent in the earth, uh, uh, and lo, here is that which thou give me. Now watch this. This guy here, he says, I know you're a hard guy, God. I know you're hard. I mean, it's tough to work for you. It's hard. And the Lord said, no, no, son, it's not hard. No, listen to what it says. He said, his Lord answered and said unto him, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not strawed. He says, yeah, you're right. You've got a hard God. Honey, you've got the kind of God you think you have. 
If you think you got a hard, wicked, beat him up, uh, take your kids and steal them for flowers in his garden. Yeah. I mean, God will say, well, you got the kind of God you talk. Well, come on. How, have you been dealing with me right? Have you been dealing with me like a man that would get you? No, I just thought you was that way. You have the God that you perceive. There's a verse in the Old Testament that says, he is your praise. I, you don't know how to pull it right up. He, if you have a concordance, you'll find it. He is your praise. He is your Lord. But what's that say? Whatever you're praising him to be. If you're lost, you need a savior. You're praising him to be the savior. You just got saved. I mean, if you're, if you're uh, sick, you're not praising him for being, you know, a, 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 mighty, a, a mighty person in heaven and all that and the, the, the overcame the grave. No, you're praising him for being a healer. He is what you say. Now, that doesn't mean he really is that way. He's the way he is. But when we perceive him one way, he doesn't go argue with you and say, no, no, I'm not that way. Here's how I am. No. He says, I got enough in that word. You can know how I am. I'm willing to have a close relationship with you until you even know the smell of my breath. Yep. Don't come say that I'm hard. If you, where did it come from? It didn't come from me. It came from, it didn't come from God. It came from that person. Church is just full of people right now. I mean, everywhere you go, there's preachers that are living in fear. They're just living in fear. Yep. Underneath them, they think the mighty hand of God is not there to protect them. They think the mighty hand of God is there to crush them if they do anything wrong. Right. It's like that. Somebody, I met a guy one time, tore a plate all to pieces trying to hit a fly. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Now, what did it say? Uh, thou, uh, he tells him uh, in this 27th verse, I ought to have given my money to the exchangers, and then uh, at my coming, you should have uh, received them my usury. And he therefore, uh, take therefore the talent from him. But up here, just a little bit worth further before he's up above. I was afraid, 25th verse, I was afraid and went and hid the talent in the earth. Hid the talent in the earth? You mean he went and dug it in the backyard and put it in the mason fruit jar and hit it, hit it behind the house. He's made out of earth. Every one of you is made out of earth. And he spent it on himself. He used it for his riotous living and drunkenness. And the, he, was ta he was talking about this same fellow back uh, the first part of the, what we were talking about. Boy, you got to be careful because your flesh will call out. You know, and, and as long as you're just uh, having a little porridge in the morning, you know, and uh, day old bread and stuff like that, you know, and all of a sudden you get some fresh bread and you get some eggs. Next thing you want is bacon. I mean, it'll wake you up to a whole world that's out there. <laughs> what did he do? He spent it on himself. He spent it on himself. I don't think the Lord's talking about a mason jar in the backyard. He's made out of earth. What'd you do with it? Well, I hid it in the earth. Um, Look at the eighth verse. Uh, the 20, excuse me, 26th verse. His Lord answered and said unto him, You wicked and slothful service. Thou know that I reap where I sowed not, and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I, would have uh, I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten. For unto every one that, is, that hath shall it be given, and he that hath not that abundance, let me get it right. For from him, I'm going to start over. For unto every one that hath shall be given, he shall, uh, he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he has. And cast this non-profit servant, cast him, uh, the unprofitable servant into outer darkness there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne here we go into the third one all right Lord for first three you're, you're, you're seeing to that the gospel is preached you're seeing to that people are fed do you money 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 and the next one well you know sure it's the Holy Ghost and we're going to hear no 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 it's money it's how you spend your money. And this one here, we just finished. It's how they handled the Lord's money. Isn't that amazing? Yep. 
This is, the, this is the one that's coming back to tell you how to be ready for him coming back. Now, when we pick a verse here and we pick a verse there, we just have to periodically take and get things into their context to see that what we're, what we're believing is true. Because the context many times is very different. Very different. Let's go a little bit further. After that talent, he comes down to 30, uh, 30, 31st verse. That's a little, you see that little mark that you have there in front of the, if you have it in front of the when? It's the, the King James marks. Good to have a King James around just to spot some of these things. That shows where a paragraph starts. That little P in the corner there. Uh, after 31. The 31st, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep and his goats, and shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. Oh, mercy, they're going to get into money here. The last thing Jesus is going to tell us about how to get ready for the kingdom, for his coming. It's, it's amazing. Kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world, for I was hungered. That means just spending money on food. He gave me meat. I was thirsty. I just talked to Brad Spencer. Uh, uh, Brad Spencer. Did, did you ever meet Brad? I think he did. He's just back from he's just back from Africa. They dug a well out there for for a tribe that's out there. Their water was dirty water out of the out of a ditch, and so they they drilled a well and got a good fresh water well going. Well, there you are. He said, "Well, what about giving drink?" Well, you uh, you gave drink to me. I was a stranger, and you took me in. That little woman, I, I'm not bragging on it, but that little woman in that with that uh, grocery cart out there. I mean, she wasn't anybody going to fool with her. And you know, I've had people, whenever we go by a corner and God tells me to give $10 to the person, I've had preachers say, don't, don't do that. I mean, they'll just buy alcohol with it. I say, my God, man, he's going to hell. Let him do something he wants to for a while. I mean, <laughs> I mean don't get upset over $10. Lord, things hadn't been breaking his way anyway. Maybe he can do what he wants to with that $10. He says, I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. Little brother last night telling about a tremendous testimony of he was visiting a sick man. And through that sickness, that man got saved because he was ready to minister to the sick. I was in prison and you came unto me. Prison ministries, a tremendous ministry. Then shall the righteous answer and say, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed thee, thirsty or give thee drink? When, uh, uh, when saw we thee a stranger and took you in, a naked and clothed thee? Or when we saw we sick and in prison and came unto you and the king said and the king shall answer and say unto them verily verily I say unto you in so much you've done it for the least of these my brethren you have done it unto me then he shall say unto them of the left depart from me you cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels what do we do with that kind of a verse church what do we do with it run to find out a doctrine that might argue against it that was, a, that was the sum total of my life before I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, when people ask me a Bible question, I'd say, well, let me pray about that tonight. I'll have an answer for you tomorrow. I'd call up Dr. Garner, and he'd call up somebody else, and a couple of hours he'd call back and say, here's, what we, here's how we handle that. And I'd go in, well, here's what that means. But when you get filled with the Holy Ghost, he puts these things on your heart. He puts these situations in your mind. But if you don't do them, Things are going to go, the things are going to go south on, with you real fast. He says, um, then shall he say the four, to them on the left, 41st verse, depart from me, ye cursed, for el, uh, uh, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. I, uh, and you clothed me not, sick, uh, not, not sick, and sick and in prison, and visited me not. Then shall they also swear, uh, swear unto him, Lord, when wast thou hungered? And he said, or when did he see you thirsty and a stranger? When was he sick and see you in prisoner? 24th verse. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you didn't, as, it, as much as you uh, did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it to me. 
and these shall go away in everlasting uh, punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Is it done? And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, four things. Be also ready. Well, how do we do it, Lord? I mean, do we, do we speak in tongues? Yeah, we do that. Do we, uh, do we uh, uh, give in the church? Yeah, we do that. No, he said, listen, here's what you do. You got to see to it that there's meat on the table of people that have no meat. How you spend your money. He says, no, he's not talking about the Holy Ghost and oil. He's talking about how you spend your money. I mean, if you got it in your pocket when the Lord comes, it's going to be a hard time explaining it if you hadn't. Now, don't misunderstand. There's some money you have to keep. Man, I mean, a part of everything you give uh, that you receive is yours to keep. But ha God has a plan for some of it. And you don't really, some of the seeds you plant now, you don't realize it. And you say, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, seed time and harvest doesn't work for me. Once you get a little older, seed time and harvest will operate different in your life. Brother John, what are you saying? No, this is what I really feel in my heart. I'm at an age now and I see it. Because now it's no more wheat and beans and carrots. But all of a sudden I look behind me and there's all kinds of fruit trees out here. And a fruit tree doesn't grow in one season. Right. It comes much, much later. See, God, if he wants us to be frugal with our planning, then he needs to be with his planning. And he says, no, you don't, you're, not need, you're not looking for a lot of carrots right now because you're just facing retirement. We got to get you some seed in that'll grow some big trees. Yep. Well, that's what I know about that. Preacher.